Hi. Today we're going to look at uh, more simple harmonic motion material. This is our second of two videos on simple harmonic motion. So our goals for today include, we're going to look at the equations we use for position, velocity, and acceleration, all as a function of time, for simple harmonic motion, especially a system like a block on a spring. We're going to look at the connection between uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion. There's an interesting connection between them. And then we're going to take another a look at a different uh, simple harmonic motion system, which is what we call a simple pendulum, which is basically a ball on a string. And as long as you've got small angular displacements from equilibrium, that system also exhibits simple harmonic motion. Okay, so if you graph as a function of time, position, velocity, and acceleration for an object, such as a block on a spring, oscillating, you're going to get things look like this. Okay, basically cosine curves and sine curves. So it's a neat little uh, relationship here. We've got this interesting force. Remember the force is uh, opposite in direction to the displacement and proportional to that displacement. And this is what gives these lovely sines and cosine graphs for position, velocity, and acceleration as a function of time. So now this graph shows that the object, if you look at the top graph, shows that the object starts at x equals a. If you look at the bottom graph, uh, second in the middle graph, <laughs> uh, you can see it starts with a velocity of zero. So we let it go from rest at x equals positive a. And then the spring pulls it back toward zero, the equilibrium length of the spring. So the velocity goes in the negative direction. The acceleration is negative because the uh, force is in the negative direction when the uh, object is on the positive side of zero. Okay, and as the um, position decreases to zero, the speed increases. And the acceleration decreases because the uh, acceleration is proportional to the force and the force is bigger the more you displace the object. So the closer the displacement gets to zero, the smaller the acceleration gets. Okay, so when the object arrives at zero, it's got some velocity in the negative direction. So it overshoots and arrives at x equals minus a eventually. And then the string spring brings it back toward x equals zero again. And when it gets there, it's passing through with a positive velocity, and that carries it all the way out again to x equals a. And then the cycle just repeats over and over and over. And of course, this is for an ideal system where there's no friction at all, no air resistance, no friction no energy loss. Okay, so, um, and again, the graphs apply for a system when you release the object from rest at x equals a at t equals zero. And you note the one oscillation, one complete oscillation here takes four seconds. And you can get that off either of any one of these three graphs. Okay, so let's look at these in a little more detail. Let's write some equations that match these graphs. So for the top graph, we can say the x position as a function of time is given by this equation that says a cosine omega t. Omega, remember we've called it angular uh, velocity before. We're going to call it angular frequency in this particular case, but we will make a connection between the angular frequency, angular velocity idea, which we came up in circular motion, really. Okay, so... Uh, and again, this equation applies only when you let the thing go from rest at x equals a at t equals zero. And if you have some different initial conditions, you've got to modify your equations appropriately. Okay, so the velocity, of course, is the slope of the position graph. Okay, so what you come up with now is that when the x graph goes like a cosine, the velocity graph goes like a negative sine graph. And where a is what's multiplying the cosine in the x equation. And you note that the maximum possible value of x equals a because why does it oscillate up and down? Well, it's the cosine feature of the x um, equation is making it do that because cosine oscillates between minus 1 and plus 1. So the biggest the cosine can ever get is 1. And so you multiply 1 by a, and that's the biggest x can get. 
So the furthest you can get from equilibrium is A. So that's why we call A the amplitude. It's how far you get from equilibrium, maximum. In the velocity equation, if we take what's multiplying the sine function, which again, the most it can ever get to is 1, then we get a maximum speed, just the magnitude of velocity, is A times omega, whatever is multiplying the sine function. Okay, so that's maximum speed, A times omega. Okay, here's the acceleration uh, equation, minus capital A omega squared cosine omega t. And again, the maximum acceleration is going to be whatever is multiplying the cos function. And if we're just worried about magnitudes here, it's just A omega squared. Okay, so maximum x is A, maximum v is A omega, maximum acceleration is A omega squared. And omega, again, is what we call the angular frequency. Okay, so let's make a connection here between uh, simple harmonic motion and circular motion. Okay, so we're going to see an animation here. And we've got, uh, toward the middle of the screen, we've got a red ball and a green ball. And they're going to experience uniform circular motion. And they're going to spin um, or go in a circle in the counterclockwise sense. And then we have red and green balls to the right and underneath, which are going to show the y component and the x component of the motion, of this circular motion. And then all the way down at the bottom, we have these squares attached to just basically blocks attached to springs. And we're going to look at the simple harmonic motion that results with this block attached to a spring. Okay? And what we're going to see is that one component of the uniform circular motion exactly matches this one-dimensional simple harmonic motion. Okay, so the equations that uh, describe them have to be the same. Okay, so here we go, have a look. And what you really want to focus on is the two red and green balls at the bottom of the screen, just above the blocks on the spring. And the two red and green balls there are going to be the uh, x components of the circular motion balls. Okay, so here we got the balls going in circles, and then we see the x component just above the simple harmonic motion. And what you want to notice is the simple harmonic motion and the x component of the circular motion exactly match at all times. Okay, so if we could think about circular motion, we can say x for something going in a circle is given by the radius of that circle multiplied by cosine theta, where theta is measured from our conventional x-axis, which is a line that points to the right. Now, of course, for uniform circular motion, we have a nice equation that relates theta and omega. Theta is simply omega t. Okay? In general, it's omega initial t plus one-half alpha t squared. But in this case, we don't have any alpha. There's no speeding up or slowing down going on. And omega initial is just omega. It's just constant angular velocity. So we can replace theta in our cosine equation, our x equation, by omega t. And so we get x is r cosine omega t. So that's the x component of this circular motion. And you know it looks basically identical to the equation we wrote for simple harmonic motion a minute ago, which was x is a cosine omega t. Okay, so some length cosine omega t. That length is the radius of the circle for circular motion, and it is the amplitude for the simple harmonic motion. So we can use the same equations, interestingly enough. Okay, so this thing, angular frequency, this thing omega, we used to call angular velocity, but now we're going to call angular frequency. What determines it? Well, here we have a block on a spring. We've displaced the block to x equals plus a. We're going to let it go from rest from there. So if we draw the free body diagram of this block, we have a normal force and a gravitational force, and they're going to cancel each other out. And the only other force we have is a spring force. We're ignoring friction and things like that. So if we displace it to x equals plus a, then the spring force points back in the negative direction, and it has a magnitude of kx, but x is a, so it's ka. Okay, so that will make the block move to the left. And if you think about what the free body diagram does, the vertical forces stay exactly the same, but the spring force goes down and down and down until you get to x equals zero when there's no spring force at all. But of course now the block has a velocity in the negative direction, so that's what 
carries it out all the way to x is minus a. And by the time it's got out there, there's a spring force pointing to the right with a size of k times a. So we can actually determine an expression for omega, the angular frequency, by analyzing the force in this specific case. But in general, what happens is that for any simple harmonic motion situation, there's a neat equation, simple equation, that relates the acceleration to the displacement. The acceleration is proportional to the displacement, and it's opposite in the direction to, dis to the displacement, which is where this minus sign comes from. And the proportionality constant we use is omega squared, where omega is the angular frequency. Okay, so that's a general equation that applies to all simple harmonic motion cases. So in a specific case, such as this block on the spring we have, we can analyze forces to figure out what omega is in, a, in this particular case. So we're going to not worry about the vertical forces because they cancel out. We don't have to worry about the horizontal forces. And so in general, if your displacement is x, your force is minus kx. And so we can set minus kx equal to ma. And then we just rearrange that a little bit, solve for a. a is minus k over m times x. So now we compare the, this equation, minus k over m times x, which we derived in the specific case of a block attached to a single spring with no friction. We can compare that to our general equation at the top right, a is minus omega squared x. And then we can say that omega squared, in this particular case, is k over m or in other words, omega, the angular frequency, is the square root of k over m. Okay, so if you make the spring stiffer, then the block moves back and forth more quickly. Omega goes up, frequency goes up. If you make the mass of the block bigger, then that's going to slow things down. Omega goes down. So that kind of makes sense. Okay, so omega is root k over m for a block and a spring, but what is it for a pendulum? So a pendulum will analyze forces here too. And we'll go through the derivation of what omega is for a simple pendulum. So simple pendulum, again, a, just a ball on a string, another good example of a harmonic motion system. So we'll start just by sort of reviewing some things. If we have a ball on a string and the ball hangs down at rest, which it is doing in picture A, we draw the forces on that ball, then we get the gravitational force down is exactly balanced by the tension force up. However, if the ball is passing through that exact same point as it's swinging in pendulum motion on a circular arc, then we have circular motion with the center of the circle being the place where the string is tied to the ceiling. So the positive direction here is up. We must have a net force going in toward the center of the circle, which requires that the tension force is bigger than mg at this point. Okay, but it's actually more interesting to look at these uh, free body diagram when the object is displaced from equilibrium. Now we have the same two forces, mg and the tension force. Tension, tension force points back along the string, mg points vertically down. Okay, so now we're going to use a coordinate system which is aligned with the string. The y direction is along the string and the x direction is perpendicular to that. So both the tension force and the mg cosine theta component of gravity, the gravitational force, are in the y direction, and they have to cancel each other out because there's no acceleration in that direction. There is an acceleration in the x direction. This is, in fact, the force that brings the pendulum back toward the equilibrium position. This is the mg sine theta component of the force of gravity. Okay, so nothing to balance that. Okay, so we're going to analyze the pendulum, and instead of using forces, like we did for the block and the spring, because that was a one-dimensional linear motion. We recognize that this is kind of a rotational setting. It's going back and forth in a circular path. So we're going to do torques instead. We're going to take torques around the support point, the point where the string is attached, in other words. Of course, the tension points back along the string, so that takes us all the way into the support point. So the tension points directly at the support point, so it gives them no torque. mg cosine theta points directly away from the support point, so that gives us no torque either. So the only torque we have is coming from this mg sine theta piece. So when we add up all our torques as vectors and set them equal to i alpha, we only have one force that's contributing to the torque. So we're going to get out our general equation for torque, r f sine theta, or sine of the angle between the line you measure r along and the line of the 
of the force. That's a better way to say it here because it's not the same theta as the theta in the picture. Okay, we get that out and apply it to the mg sine theta force. And our r is L, the length of the string. That's how far away we are from the point of rotation. And the force is mg sine theta. And the angle between the line we measure distance along, we measure distance along the string, a distance L. And mg sine theta is perpendicular to that. So we have a 90 degree angle, so we get sine of 90, which is 1. So our torque magnitude is L mg sine theta. And we set that equal to I times alpha. Now, in this case, we get all our mass concentrated at the same distance from the point of rotation. So anytime you have that scenario, your rotational inertia is simply ML squared, where L is the distance that the point of rotation is from all the mass. So that's what I is here, ML squared. And we multiply that by alpha. And just like we had a minus sign in the minus kx equals ma equation for the mass on the spring, we have a minus sign here. Because if you displace the pendulum in one direction, then your torque is always taking you back toward equilibrium in the opposite direction. Okay, so the torque and the, and, uh, the displacement are in totally opposite directions here. So that's where this uh, minus sign comes from. Okay, so we'll simplify that a little bit. The mass cancels out. For instance, one of the factors of L cancels out. We rearrange that. We solve for alpha. Alpha is minus g over L times sine of theta. Okay, now, we don't really like the sine theta showing up. It's hard to work with, so let's see if we can get rid of that somehow, replace it by something a little easier. Well, it turns out that we can use the small angle approximation. And you can try this yourself on your calculator if your calculator is in radian mode. So if you put in a small angle say 10 degrees or less, and 10 degrees is something like, uh, what, one-sixth of radians, so something like 0.15 or less radians, okay? So if you put in, say, 0.1 in your calculator, hit the sign button, when your calculator is in radians mode, you will get an answer pretty close to 0.1. So sine theta and theta are pretty close to the same thing for small angles. So we can replace sine theta in our equation by theta. So now we got alpha is pretty much minus g over L theta. And this has the simple harmonic motion form. SHM stands for simple harmonic motion. This looks like the simple harmonic motion form alpha is minus omega squared theta. Now, when we were talking about the mass on the spring, we said the general form is A is minus omega squared x. So this alpha is minus omega squared theta kind of rotational equivalent of that general equation for simple harmonic motion. So again, by inspection, we can figure what omega is for this particular case of the simple pendulum. And so omega squared is g over L, and omega itself is square root of g over L. So for a simple pendulum, the angular frequency is determined by what planet you're on, the value of g. And then the only other thing it depends on is the length of the string that the object is attached to. So one really interesting thing here is that the mass doesn't matter. Okay, you could have a 50 gram ball, a 500 gram ball, a 5 kilogram ball, and they go back and forth at exactly the same rate. Okay? So, independent of mass, which is totally different from the mass on the spring, where the omega had a big dependence on the mass, but here there's no mass dependence at all. So that's kind of an interesting result for the pendulum. Okay, so now we've seen uh, two examples of how you derive the angular frequency in particular cases. And the angular frequency, once you know it, is all over those equations. X is A, cos omega t, V is minus A omega, sine omega t, things like that. you got omegas all over the place. You're really going to know what they are, what omega is, actually what it is, to solve any kind of problem for simple harmonic motion. Okay, so uh, that is all for this session.